<clears throat> Good evening, everybody. I want to say thanks for having Josh and I. It's a pleasure to come to Missoula and be able to teach you guys. I haven't been to Missoula for a while. My mom actually lives over here in the area, and so I came over a lot in college. Uh, she lived about half an hour north, and now is about an hour south in Hamilton. So it's great to be back. This is a wonderful city. Um, so thanks for having us. Thanks for having me and my boys and Josh out. Uh, it's a joy. I wish my wife and the littles could have come, but we had something come up at home. So unfortunately, they are not here. Uh, Preston, thanks for the introduction. Uh, it makes it to where I can skip over it, and I don't have to do all that. So appreciate it. Um, we are going to dive right in. We have a lot of ground to cover, and our sessions are not that long. So uh, we're going to start uh, by reading our main passage. It's in Colossians chapter 3, verses 18 through 24. Wives, submit to your husbands as is fitting in the Lord. Husbands, love your wives and do not be harsh with them. Children, obey your parents in everything, for this pleases the Lord. <clears throat> Fathers, do not provoke your children lest they become discouraged. Bond servants, obey in everything those who are your earthly masters, not by way of eye service or as people pleasers, but with sincerity of heart, fearing the Lord. Whatever you do, work heartily as for the Lord and not for men, knowing that from the Lord you will receive the inheritance as your reward. You are serving the Lord Christ. I'm going to pray really quick. Father, we thank you for the ability to come together freely, to study and to learn your word. You are a great and mighty God who has blessed us immensely. We seek to glorify you in all things and learn how to enjoy you in this wonderful world that you have created for us. Help us in our study and application. Amen. So my session tonight is titled The Marriage Covenant and Its Foundations, as you can see. Um, you are going to hear the word covenant a lot this weekend. Josh and I are big fans of covenant and what covenant means. If you haven't heard that term, um, well, you'll hear it from us. Uh, you might have heard it reading through scripture. It is there. It's there often. Uh, you might have heard it listening to Preston preach and teach around God's covenants with us uh, or in reading books. Uh, so what I'm planning to do tonight is just lay out what a covenant is. What do we mean when we say the term covenant? And then is the marriage relationship a covenant? Spoiler alert, it is. We'll talk about that. And then what is the purpose of this covenant, right? God is sovereign. God is wise. He's created things for a reason, for a purpose. And so what is the purpose of the marriage covenant? Uh, like I said, we are gonna, we're, we're going to go through this quickly, so we're not going to be able to deep dive too much. Josh will be able to tackle some of that in the next session, and then we also have Q&A. So if I don't dive into anything that you want me to, write it down and, we'll, and ask a question, and we'll dive into it. So uh, I want to start by giving you a definition of covenant. When we say the word covenant, what do we mean? A covenant is a solemn oath sovereignly administered, sovereignly administered or administrated with attendant blessings and curses. I'm going to say that again. A, a covenant is a solemn oath, sovereignly administrated with attendant blessings and curses. This is different than a typical contract or an agreement or a, any other kind of typical relationship, right? There is a significant difference. For instance, most, if not all, covenants are bound with blood. We see that consistently throughout Scripture. Uh, there is a solemnity, a seriousness to a covenant that comes from the sovereign administration of it, right? God is a part of these relationships. The Lord really is the binding agent in a covenant. And in our text, this is exactly what Paul is talking about. He has just finished, if you flip back in Colossians, to chapters 1, 2, uh, and the beginning of 3, he's talking about how we're alive in Christ, right? He's given us a new life, put, uh, and he's asking us to put on the new self, put on the new man, leave the old man behind. And then he exhorts us with this text uh, that we just read, 18 through uh, 24, uh, about rules for Christian households. If you notice, every type of relationship here is covenantal, Right? He is dealing with, uh, and, and if we deal with these covenants wrong, there's severe consequences. 
He's looking through the text right. He's dealing with wives to husbands, husbands to wives, children to parents, uh, parents to children, bond servants to their earthly masters. These would have been seen when this was written in the time of Scripture. And even now I would, I would propose that these are seen as our primary covenantal obligations. These are the, the deep-seated relationships that we have that a believer has in their life. And Paul bases all of these covenants on the fundamental covenant of our relationship to God, right? Walking through, we're going to just step through this. Wives, submit to your husbands as is fitting in the Lord. It's not because Paul says so. It's because it's fitting in the Lord. Husbands, love your wives. Do not be harsh with them. Children, obey your parents in everything. Why? Well, for this pleases the Lord. Bond servants, obey in everything those who are your earthly masters, not by way of eye service as people pleasers, but with sincerity of heart, fearing the Lord. He's constantly pointing back to the Lord. Whatever you do, whichever one of those relationships you fall into, whatever you do, work heartily as for the Lord and not for men. It's not about the men, it's about who God is, right? And he ends this by saying, you are serving the Lord Christ. This is an obligatory relationship. God is our creator, he's our founder, he's our sustainer. Uh, we have a binding to him. I want to give kind of an example of this, just to maybe put teeth to it, put flesh on the bones of what we're talking about. Uh, I watched a movie recently called The Covenant. Have you guys who's seen that? Has anyone seen The Covenant? Pretty solid film, very much enjoy it. Um, it uh, tells a, it's based on true events, but it's a fictional story, right? And it's about uh, our time in the Middle East as a military um, and how we were trying to deal with the Taliban. And what would happen, we, uh, our government actually made uh, relationships with locals and said, hey, if you're an interpreter for us, we'll get you and your family visas and we'll bring you back to the U.S. So we'll get you out of this situation <laughs> if you help us. Uh, the main character in here, his name is John. Um, and, uh, spoiler alert, if you haven't seen it, sorry, you've had enough time to see it. Um, the, uh, main character, John, his whole unit basically gets killed, uh, and he almost gets killed, and his translator, Ahmed, basically drags him many, many miles across the Middle Eastern desert to get him back to his base. John is in a comatose state. He gets back home, wakes up, realizes he's safe, but then also realizes that Ahmed and his wife and his newborn baby are still back in the Middle East, and that our government, our government didn't do what they said it would do. And so there's this, he, he basically starts to lose his mind trying to figure out how to get these visas for Ahmed. And there's this critical point, there's this breaking point in the movie where John is standing before his commanding officer, and his commanding officer's like, dude, you need to chill. You're freaking out. Like he has a, a recording of a phone call he made, and John is legitimately like losing his mind. Um, and John stands up and he looks at his commanding officer and he says, you think if I could be shot of this debt, I wouldn't be. You think if I could just go through the usual channels, I wouldn't? That is not how this debt works. It demands a result, not an appeasement. There is a hook in me, one that you cannot see, but it is there. And you think I have a choice? I have no choice. That's the obligation of a covenant. There's no walking away. There's no no-fault divorce. There's no, ah, eh, no big deal. There is a deep-seated obligation. There's a relationship between those people and God. John is expressing that burden. Covenants put hooks in us. They come with conditions which, if honored, bring significant blessing. But if spurned, if dishonored, bring significant blessing curses. John ultimately doesn't get help from his commanding officer, and he goes on his own to save Ahmed and his family and gets them back, right? He felt that hook, and he responded to it. We see this blessing curse paradigm in the Old Testament, specifically in Deuteronomy chapter 8. I'm not going to read the whole thing, but I recommend you go read it. Um, this is after God's law has been laid out a second time, right? Deuteronomy, second law. That's what the book is talking about. Basically, the Israelites have died off in the desert, and uh, Moses is giving the law again to the second generation a second time. Uh, and he says, the, the first few verses of 28, he says, And if you faithfully obey the voice of the Lord your God, being careful to do all his commandments that I command you today, 
the Lord your God will set you high above all the nations of the earth. Just an attendant blessing, right? And all these blessings shall come upon you and overtake you if you obey the voice of the Lord your God. Then he goes on for a number of verses to explain the blessings that come from obeying God's covenant. About halfway through the chapter, this verse comes up. It says, but if you will not obey the voice of the Lord your God, or be careful to do all his commandments and his statutes that I commanded you today, then all these curses shall come upon you and overtake you. So there is blessing that comes from obeying uh, covenant, uh, responding properly, and then there are curses if we don't. That's fundamentally what a covenant is, right? It's a sovereign bond, a sovereign oath, Sov- or a, a, a solemn bond, sovereignly administered with attendant blessings and curses. We see that in our relationship with God. That's a covenant. Now we're going to look at the marriage relationship and deal with whether that is a covenant or not. We see very, very similar verbiage in Scripture around oaths and bindings and hooks in a number of different spots when it comes to marriage. In Genesis, Matthew, and Ephesians, we read, Therefore a man shall leave his father and his mother and hold fast to his wife. They shall become one flesh. All right, so holding fast, one flesh, there's this binding language there. Jesus actually takes it a step further in the Matthew passage. He says, What therefore God has joined together, sovereignly administrated. Right? God is the one joining them together. What God has joined together, let not man separate. There's a joining, there's a binding. 1 Corinthians chapter 7, we read that the husband and the wife should give one another their conjugal rights. Right? These are rights, things that are obligated to be given. We also see a few verses later that an unbelieving spouse is made holy through this union. Right? So the state of one is given to the other. There is a strong tie there. Uh, and then a few verses later, we actually see that a wife is bound to her husband till death. Clearly, Paul is talking about something greater than just a contract, something that we can easily walk away from without it having severe, dire consequences. I think the passage that helps most to clarify to us that we have a covenant in marriage is Malachi chapter 2. Verses 13 and 14 teach us, You cover the Lord's altar with tears, with weeping and groaning, because he no longer regards the offering or accepts it with favor from your hand. So something's happened that made it to where the Lord's altar, the Lord is rejecting the sacrifices of the people. He doesn't want anything to do with them. But you say, why not? What's wrong, basically? How come? Because the Lord was witness between you and the wife of your youth, to whom you have been faithless, though she is your companion and your wife by covenant. Very clearly, by covenant. Right? So there's a covenantal relationship. When that covenant is spurned, we see that the Lord rejects our offerings. He doesn't want anything to do with them. We'll dive more into that in a little bit. This fundamental understanding of covenant marriage is what does away and negates the idea, the farce of gay or transgender marriage. There is no sovereign administration there. The Lord has nothing to do with that. They may have some form of civil union, but there is no blessing in that relationship whatsoever. The Lord is not there. Marriage is indeed a covenant, a binding agreement between us, our spouses, and God the Father, who is the creator and the witness of our union, the same way he was the creator and witness of the union between Adam and Eve. <clears throat> and Eve. So what then is the purpose of marriage? God doesn't create anything without reason. I said that a little bit earlier. He has purpose, and so little uh, maybe audience participation. What is the purpose of marriage? What do you think? Ideas, thoughts? Bring glory to the Lord. Bring glory to God. Sanctification. Sanctification. Awesome. Agreed. Any other thoughts? Procreation, children. Okay. Anything else? Demonstrating God's relationship to us. Yep. Awesome. Love it. Those are all correct <laughs> answers. Um, I'm gonna uh, give. An, I'm gonna ask another question that uh, is gonna help define my thesis for the night. 
So uh, Josh teaches catechism classes. We catechize our boys. Uh, the Westminster, the first question of the Westminster catechism is what is man's chief end? Does anyone know the answer to that question? What is the chief end of man? Glorify God. And? Enjoy him forever. Enjoy him forever. Man's chief end is to glorify God and enjoy him forever. So softball question. What is the chief end of marriage? To glorify God and enjoy him forever. That is my thesis for tonight. The purpose of marriage, similar to all other things, is to glorify God and enjoy him forever. There are sub-purposes that we hit on a few that we'll dive into tonight. Three primary means of how we glorify God and enjoy him would be companionship, multiplication, procreation, like Preston put it, and protection. Right? So the purpose, glorify God and enjoy him forever. And the sub-purposes, the ways we do that is companionship, multiplication, and protection. And that is what we're going to walk through next, those uh, kind of five things. So high-level, glorifying God, enjoying God. What does that mean? What's it mean to glorify God? To give something glory really means to make it famous, right? To, to shower attention uh, and glory at it, to make everyone know about it. We do this in our culture uh, with many different things, right? But probably primarily athletes, celebrities, uh, maybe entrepreneurs, businessmen, those sorts of things. We talk about, we uh, post stories about, we do all that sort of stuff. We focus on them. Uh, we might wear their jerseys, we might read their books, we might listen to their podcasts, um, doing those sorts of things, listening to their wisdom. With God, we should be doing the same exact thing, but almost definitely to a higher extent. We are called to be holy just as Christ is holy, and we give glory, someone said earlier, by reflecting his image in us and his relationship with us, right? We're a, a mirror, we're a window to look through uh, that shines beautifully on who God is and what he's done with us. That's how we give glory to God. And God has explicitly chosen marriage as a primary means of doing this. He uses marriage as a window to see the covenant he has with us as his people. This is very explicit in Ephesians chapter 5, verses 22 through 33. I'm going to read through this quickly again. We're not going to deep dive into this, but we can later. <laughs> Wives, submit to your own husbands as to the Lord. This is going to sound very similar to Colossians. Uh, submit to your husbands as to the Lord. For the husband is the head of the wife, even as Christ is the head of the church, his body, and is himself its savior. Now as the church submits to Christ, so also wives should submit in everything to their husbands. Husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her, that he might sanctify her, having cleansed her by the washing of water with the word, so that he might, be pre might present the church to himself in splendor without spot or wrinkle or any such thing that she might be holy and without blemish. In the same way, husbands should love their wives as their own bodies. He who loves his wife loves himself, for no one ever hated his own flesh, but nourishes and cherishes it, just as Christ does the church, because we are members of his body. Therefore, man shall leave his father and mother, hold fast to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. This mystery is profound, and I am saying that it refers to Christ and the church. However, let each one of you Love his wife as himself, and let the wife see that she respects her husband. So over and over again in this passage, we see a direct comparison between husbands and wives and Christ and the church, right? Non-stop. That's the whole point. Wives submit to your husbands as to the Lord. Christ is the head of the church. The church submits to Christ as Christ loved the church. In the same way, husbands should love their wives as their own bodies, cherish, just as Christ does the church. This mystery is profound. I'm saying that it refers to Christ and the church. So God has explicitly chosen the marital relationship as a mirror, an image of his relationship with the church. By mirroring him, by putting on his jersey, right, by reading his scripture, by teaching people about it through our relationships, we are giving glory to God. Right? That's the whole point. We're mirroring him. We're making him famous by modeling his relationship with us. So that's giving glory. That's glorifying God. What about enjoying God? One of the primary themes in the book of Ecclesiastes is that there's nothing better to do under the sun but to eat, drink, and be joyful in and through the work that God has given him. In Ecclesiastes 8, we see that uh, it will be well with those who fear God. And I commend joy, for man has nothing better under the sun but to eat and drink and be joyful. So to take joy in something is to delight in it, to take 
pleasure in it. So we're called to delight in God, to take pleasure in God. This means enjoying his word and his works, right? Enjoying scripture that he's given us, the tools that he's put in front of us to teach us about who he is, and also the works that he's done on this world, whether that be uh, the church, right, brings much joy. Uh, And what we're going to talk about tonight is marriage specifically. The ability to take joy in our toil, Ecclesiastes also teaches us, comes from God alone. God is the one that makes it to where we can enjoy the world that he's put us in. So like I said, we have glorification of God, right? The main purpose of marriage is to glorify God and enjoy him forever. And we have our three subcategories. So we're going to start jumping through those. Again, sorry, I feel like I'm going fast. Uh, The first one we talked about was companionship. So we have companionship, multiplication, and protection. So what I'm going to do is we're going to talk about each one of those individually, and we're going to talk about how it brings glory to God and enjoyment to us of God, right? So companionship, how does it glorify? How do we enjoy? Multiplication, how does it glorify? How do we enjoy? So on and so forth. So we're going to start with glorifying God in companionship. The true story of the gospel is that we have been redeemed out of a family of sin and death and into a family of life and righteousness. We have a new name. We've been pulled out of that. We're no longer sons and daughters of the devil. We were. We're now sons and daughters of the Most High God. In marriage, husbands and wives model this directly, right? Wives leave behind their old name. There's an intention there. There's a a glorifying of God there. Right? They leave behind their old name, and they, take, they bind themselves to their new husband, and they take his name, they take his legacy, they take his heritage. This brings glory to God. Husbands pick up responsibility. They bring a new person and future persons uh, under their purview, under their direction and leadership, and they step into the fray to sacrificially provide for them and protect them the same way that Christ did when he went to the cross. And that companionship, right, taking and bringing in a bride, we're modeling Christ. Another part of our story as Christians is that Christ continues to draw us nearer and nearer to him after he has chosen us. He's continually wooing us. He's loving us. He's sanctifying us. He's making us more like him. In Christian marriage, husbands choose their wives, and the wives respond. And after that, the task isn't done, right? It's not like, oh, sweet, good to go. Everything's perfect from here. Husbands are actually called to wash their wives with the word. We just read that in Ephesians 5, right? Now as the church submits to Christ, husbands love your wives as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her, that he might sanctify her, having cleansed her by the washing of water with the word. So their task is to wash their wives with the word. In doing so, they're modeling what Christ does with us, what the church does with us, giving glory to God. A husband is to beautify his wife and to participate in sanctifying them. That is his task. And then finally, in Christian marriage, two persons come together to become one flesh. This is a mystery and a wonder Paul teaches us, but in a lesser, non-directly comparable way, it models the companionship of the Holy Trinity. Three persons, one being, right? The companionship there, the multiplicity, the, the division there, is something that we see in a lesser state in marriage. That's how marriage in companionship glorifies God. How does it uh, help us enjoy him? Well, it's a very rare soul that is a true lone wolf or a hermit, right? We're created to be around people. Scripture tells us it's not good for man to be alone. We build cities, towns, states, nations because we crave community. God made Eve for Adam And Adam's response was immediate poetry, right? He's like, mind blown, bone of my bone, flesh of my flesh. Poetry. I would say that companionship was a joyful moment for him, right? His breath was taken away. Uh, I think another really tangible uh, example of the joy that comes from uh, marital companionship is just a comparison between uh, a bachelor or a bachelorette pad and a home. You guys are probably familiar with this distinction, maybe more than I am, right? Um, The bachelor pad probably feels a little stale, uh, a little stagnant, uh, maybe a little lifeless, 
might be a little bit of a smell of death, right? Like <laughs> gym shorts, I like it. <laughs> not great. Um, the bachelorette pad is probably a little bit nicer. There's at least pictures ha- hung on the wall, all right? Maybe some cookies every now and then, but probably the stench of some emotional baggage under the couch that hasn't been dealt with. But you walk into a home, a good Christian home, and there's an aroma that meets you at the front door of peace, of uh, it's, it's warm, it's inviting. Uh, you can tell, right? There's nothing festering. Things have been dealt with. You probably want to curl up on the couch and take a nap, and the couch is probably pretty comfy, right? There's probably a blanket there too. The woman brings this beauty, this delicacy to the home, while the man brings this stability and resolution of issues. And when those two things come together, this pairing is wonderful, it's beautiful, and it's life, right? It's joy. When man and woman come together in companionship, there is joy, and that leads us to our next point of multiplication, right? When a husband and wife come together, uh, they create new life. So how does multiplication bring glory to God? Well, God, in the power of his own being, is able to create and form out of nothing, right? That's how he made us. That's how he made the world. He spoke ex nihilo. And in creation, God created a helper who was made in his own image and tasked him with naming and caring for his work, right? That's what God did. Well, in Christian marriage, with God's blessing, husbands do likewise. They create, they have a helper, and their helper is tasked with helping them name and care for the creation of their hands, right? This is a direct correlation to what God did in creation. The key thing to remember here is that our children are a gift of God. Even in our work of creating them, we should be turning to the Lord and glorifying him for the good gifts, right? So we're modeling, we're mirroring him, but then we're also turning and praising his name for the blessings he's given us. Uh, my, uh, my wife and I have five kids, as I said earlier, five boys, uh, and we will often get, get comments about the number. Five, I guess, is a lot nowadays. Um, things like, you guys know how kids are made, right? Yeah, we do. <laughs> um, uh, or are, are they all both of yours? Like, yes, yeah, they are. Um, don't you wish you had a girl? We get that one often. Uh, and then uh, uh, the occasional distant relative will say something like, are you guys finally done? Sort of thing, right? So uh, the reason I bring this up, right, multiplication glorifies God, because these comments, what we've found is they're a wonderful opportunity to just turn and praise God. Say, yeah, God's blessed us immensely. God's given us five boys. What a joy, right? This is wonderful. To take those moments of maybe a worldly view of children Uh, as a burden or something like that and say, no, actually, this is our future. These are uh, eternal beings we have here. There is a a strong intentionality in Scripture to God being called the Father and church being called our mother. There's a distinction there that, that Scripture gives us. And earthly fathers image God, they glorify God, and as far as they lead, protect, and provide, you guys have heard that, I'm sure, for their families. Right? So by doing that, we are imaging God through our multiplication. Mothers image the church in far as they feed, nurture, and care for their children and then help in the purpose and the mission of their husbands. By doing these things, we bring glory to God because we're mirroring the way that he works with us. Right? Again, glorifying God, giving him praise, making him famous. So how does multiplication bring enjoyment? Well, uh, Many of you are parents, and I'm sure you've felt the joy I feel when you get home from a long day of work and your children come running to you, if your children can run. Uh, It is very, very fun to be a father. Uh, There is lots of Nerf guns and wrestling and roughhousing and uh, trampolines and uh, the sort in my house, and it brings me very, very much joy to do those things. God's blessed us with the task of raising little people, Uh, and as I said earlier, these are little souls that will never die. We all live eternally, it's just where, right? So this is a big task. It's a very important task. Uh, but it's very, very joyful. He, that, that immensity can overwhelm us at times, but then you look at these little creatures and they're just bubbling with joy, right? Like 
bubbling. It just comes out of every orifice of them. Uh, and that makes it easier. Uh, it makes it safer. Uh, for example, one of my favorite moments, like I said, is when I get home. My boys come running, they come crawling, they're showing me their magnetile ship that they made or a drawing they made for me. Uh, or Owen's thing nowadays is, Dad, look, I got this big scratch and it doesn't even hurt. <laughs> look at this, Dad, I stabbed myself with a toothpick and it doesn't even hurt. <laughs> it's the best. I love it. But the point here is that they are yearning for my attention and my love, and they, give, they, they seek that by giving me their attention and their love. And that is immensely joyful. I love it. But I think the root of all this, right, we're talking about eternal beings, the joy that we get from uh, raising them. Uh, this joy really comes from the fact that God has put eternity in our hearts. Ecclesiastes teaches us that. We innately long desperately for eternity. We long desperately to do something that will last. And that's not the way this world is set up, right? Ecclesiastes, it's repetitive. It's a chasing after the wind. We do the same thing over and over and over again. Somewhat. But with our kids, they last forever. They will last forever. And I think that's where that joy comes from. When we actually invest in eternal things, there is a different type of satisfaction. There's a different type of joy come from raising children. So the last way that we glorify God and enjoy him forget forever uh, in marriage is through protection. Um, so uh, God cares for his people and he protects them in a myriad of different ways, right? Many, many different ways. God keeps us from pits that we don't even see. Proverbs talks about this, right? Those he loves, he protects from the pit that the wicked have set up. And you don't even know it. There's a couple good stories that are examples of this. In The Horse and His Boy, one of C.S. Lewis's Narnia novels, um, Shasta is walking up a hill to uh, go help protect Arkenland from the Kalermans. Uh, and it's pitch black, and he's walking up the hill, and he hears this, this breathing next to him. And it just wigs him out. But he's on a really stupid horse that he can't make gallop. And so he's like, what the heck? <laughs> Terrified inside, but he knows the horse won't do anything. And so he's going and he's walking and he realizes, he starts talking to it and he's like, are you a giant? Because it's like this moist breathing. And he's terrified. And he gets up, it, it's actually Aslan. Uh, he gets up and the, the sun starts to come up and he gets out of this deep darkness and he looks back and there was a single path that he could have tread along to get to where he was going. And the thing that was terrifying him was walking along his left to keep him from going over a precipice. That's what God does. For us. He protects us from things we don't even see. We get the same sort of picture in the Pilgrim's Progress by Bunyan, right? As the pilgrim is going through um, the valley of the shadow of death, again, pitch black, and he's winding and wandering and going, and somehow he makes it through the other side. And when he turns around and he looks back, he's amazed. He's blown away by the fact that he made it through. It was only through God's help, right? Oftentimes we're blind to the traps around us, but God keeps us from those things. The point here with marriage is that in a healthy relationship, in a healthy marital relationship, husbands protecting their wives and wives protecting their husbands keeps us from these small temptations that might cause us to stumble, right? Whether they be emotional temptations of fear and anxiety for women or sexual temptations for men, right? Men loving their wives, protecting them, are able to step in and help bring calmness and resolution through their strength uh, in emotional times. And women, through... Uh, giving their conjugal rights to their husbands are able to keep them from often things that would draw their eyes or distract them and might wear down their defenses against sexual temptation. So healthy marriages protect, cause protection to fall upon husband and wife. God also protects us from drifting away from him. Right? God and his bride, the church, come together regularly in worship. It's a command. We're called to do that. We're welcomed into the presence of the Most High God, and we experience a number of blessings in the corporate gathering that you do not experience anywhere else. There's a blessing upon the gathering. Some of those are closer and increased intimacy with the Lord and the church, right? He is wooing us as we're being taught by his mouthpiece. We're welcomed into his presence, Hebrews teaches us. We also have consistent affirmation of security in our faith, right? As we're being taught, we're affirmed uh, that our faith is sure. It is planted on solid ground. It's not shaky because Christ is not shaky. Christ is sure. 
We have help against temptations and assistance in raising our children. And in Christian marriage, when husbands and wives come together intimately, we get these same blessings. And so the, uh, the correlation here, the way that we glorify God, we consistently go to worship, to praise God, and in a healthy Christian marriage, we have a healthy sex life as well. The correlation is between the worship service and our intimate life. Uh, by doing those things, we are glorifying God when we do them well. Okay, so how does protection and joy bring enjoyment? Marriage brings enjoyment of God through the protections that it provides. When men are strong and lead well, it really does give to their wives a freedom from emotional insecurities and concerns. Wives are able to rest and rely on the stability and steadfastness of their husband. Right? When there's uh, something of concern, something frantic, a husband who's able to step into that moment and provide clarity, provide security, provide direction, uh, brings a calming factor to that situation. His emotional strength as well as his uh, physical strength brings peace. God made men to be tough and strong emotionally and physically. One of the things we talk about in our household a lot, if the boys were down here, I would ask them, what is the glory of young men? And they would all say their strength. Proverbs teaches us that. Uh, The glory of young men is their strength. And this strength and protection brings peace to the wife and the home that helps joy flourish. Joy really does flourish in this Not only that, but the love from a husband beautifies his wife. We talked about that a little bit earlier. His work to provide for her, not just physically, but emotionally and spiritually, results in her being more pleasurable to him. This is physical, right? When a husband loves his wife well, she physically gets more beautiful, as well as emotionally, as well as spiritually. It is a tangible effect. What this does, it really is a blessing of God, is it uh, ramps up that vibrant and fruitful sex life, right? Because there's more attraction, there's more beauty. And this, of course, brings more joy and more protection for the husband. This dance really is beautiful, glorifying, and joyful. Okay, that's a lot. Again, we didn't deep dive. I'm going to bring it in for a landing. I'm going along. Uh, I want to close by talking about blessings and curses, right? We talked about what a covenant is, and how covenants come with blessings and curses. So um, a a covenant, solemn oath, sovereignly administrated with attendant blessings and curses. It's not good to be alone, right? We know scripture says that. But it is better to live in the corner of the housetop than in a house shared with a quarrelsome wife. Sounds pretty alone to me, right? Children are a blessing and a heritage from the Lord, Psalm 127. At the same time, a foolish son is sorrow to his mother. Right? A godly spouse is more valuable than gold, but a spurned spouse results in unanswered prayers. How do we reconcile this? What's the understanding here? The principle is that a squandered blessing becomes a curse. The good thing that we ignore, the good thing that we don't take care of, the obligation that we have because of this covenant when not fulfilled, that blessing becomes a curse. A beautiful spouse becomes uh, quarrelsome. You don't even want to go into that house. To our metaphor earlier, the aroma is horrid, and you can tell. Children, instead of being a joy, bring sorrow. Right? And ultimately, uh, a godly spouse, when spurned, becomes unanswered prayers. The thing that was beautiful and enjoyable becomes bitter and distasteful. And in regards to the marriage covenant, a lot is at stake. So we could either mirror God well, or we could lie about his character as husbands. Right? Saying that if, if we're faithful husbands, what we're doing is we're saying that God is faithful. But if we're unfaithful husbands, we're blaspheming God's name. We're blaspheming the name of Christ. In uh, uh, Exodus, uh, it tells us that uh, God visits the iniquity of the fathers on the children to the third and the fourth generation of those who hate him, but shows steadfast love to thousands of generations to those who love him. So generational blessings or generational curses based on how we interact in this covenant. And then enjoying God 
and experiencing his protection versus being given over to the lusts of our flesh and sorrow. We see this in Romans 1, where they're just given over. They're left. They're, they're ignored, basically. So bringing it in for landing, what do we do? How do we live into the marriage covenant? The charge is to remember that marriage is not about you or your spouse. It's not about either one of you. It's about glorifying God and enjoying him forever. That's the purpose. Wives, submit to your husbands as is fitting in the Lord. Husbands, love your wives and do not be harsh with them, knowing that you are serving the Lord Christ. Be faithful to your God. Serve him rightly. Seek glory for his name. Enjoy his blessings. Guard yourselves in your spirit and let none of you be faithless to the wife of your youth. For the man who does not love his wife but divorces her says the Lord, the God of Israel, covers his garment with violence, says the Lord of hosts. So guard yourselves in your spirit and do not be faithless. Father, we want to thank you for the covenant of marriage, for giving us something that can so closely model you in your covenant to us, for bestowing upon us the blessings of companionship, children, and protections against the ways of the world. We pray that you would help us keep our eyes on you and serve you diligently here in our tasks on earth. Amen.